Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the second last day of our first ever online summer school. Um, those of you who attended other courses, I'm sure, thank, uh, thank you for your patience for putting up with all our teething problems. And I'm sure it's been a tough learning curve for everyone the last year. It's my great honor and privilege to introduce to you Professor Anton Harbour, who I think probably needs very little introduction. Anyway, most of us who came of age intellectually in the 1980s, like myself, used the weekly mail, which he founded and later became known as the Mail and Guardian, as a go-to news source for everything that we wanted to understand. And I think there's probably no better person in South Africa than to address the topic at hand. Uh, Professor Harbour was the founding editor of the Weekly Mail, known as the Mail and Guardian. He was the chair of the South African Conference of Editors in 1991, as well as the chair of the National Association of Broadcasters in 98 and chair of the Freedom of Expression Institute in 2010. He also serves on the board of directors of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. And in March 2016, to many of our great delight, he became the editor-in-chief of ENCA. He's also the Caxton Professor of Journalism at his alma mater, the University of the Witwatersrand, and he is now an adjunct professor of journalism. He's a co-editor of two books. One is about HIV AIDS and investigative journalism, and he's the author of a third book on Ditz, entitled Ditzluert. I hand you over to Anton Harbour now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Can you hear and see me clearly? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Well, thank you very yes, much. Yes, we can. Thank you. It, thank you very much. It's a great delight to uh, be joining the summer school and to talk about the book I released just a few months ago. Um, and I hope that we can engage and take questions and have discussions after I've talked about it. You see the cover of uh, my book on the screen, um, I hope. Um, it's really an investigation into investigators. So you can imagine it's been quite a complex thing to do in that I'm investigating my peers, my colleagues, my friends uh, and a few of my enemies. So it's been an extraordinarily interesting experience, which I'm very pleased to talk about. The story begins here. Um, sorry, the story begins here. When on the 14th of October 2018, the Sunday Times, uh, many of you would have seen it, published uh, an extraordinary apology. Um, it really surprised us all. It had been, uh, the, they apologized for three stories which had been under discussion, controversial stories, which we'd all been watching um, with growing dismay in the months leading up to uh, this apology. As you see from the quote, um, all they really said was something went wrong in the process of gathering the information and reporting, and that they allowed themselves to be manipulated by those with interior motives. Um, and again, they said, we allowed our stories to be abused and we apologize for that. And that was a complete mystery to many readers. Um, you might recall that when uh, the famous New York Times had a similar problem with the accuracy of stories, um, they ran a full internal investigation and published thousands and thousands of words in their own newspaper looking at every element of what they've got right or wrong and uh, why that happened. Here you see in the Sunday Times, the editor wrote a mere two columns. He didn't tell us who'd been uh, manipulating them. He gave some idea of some of the mistakes they made, but only in the vaguest possible way. So it left us wondering what on earth had, um, had happened at the newspaper. It was a most unsatisfying apology. It was an extraordinary thing for the new editor to do. And indeed, this new editor, Bongani Sikoko, was brought in precisely to do this and to clean it up. 
Um, the apology relates to um, these three stories. 11th of December, the Cato Manor story, shoot to kill. The story of an alleged hit squad operating as part of the Hawks in KZN. 23rd October 2011, sent to die, the story of illegal renditions of Zimbabwean criminals from South Africa back to Zimbabwe. And perhaps the best known of all, uh, Love Affair Rock SARS, which was uh, about, um, it was the first story in a series of stories um, about uh, goings on at SARS. Um, what is most striking about all of these stories, but particularly the SARS story, is that it wasn't one story. Um, these are SARS stories over the years. It ended up being 35 stories over two years. So it wasn't just that they ran one story um, that contained errors. It was systematic. It was long term. Um, when they were challenged on the stories, they dug themselves deeper and deeper and stood by their stories. Um, in a most extraordinary uh, manner. Um, but what do these three stories all have in common? Um, they all, when one dig, dug down into the nature of these stories, they were all about key institutions um, in um, the state accountability mechanism. And um, central to each story were individuals who had excellent reputations for being good public servants and uh, who happened also to be involved in, in investigations into um, people involved in state capture. In the case of Shoot to Kill, it was the well-known General Boyson, regional head of the Hawks. Um, in the Sent to Die story, it was um, the, the head of the Hawks, Anwar Dramat, and the Gauteng head of the Hawks. And in the SARS stories, it was the whole SARS institution at the center of which uh, was Ivan Pille and Johan van Lochrenberg. Um, so the apology from the Sunday Times raised tough questions about who manipulated them why did the Sunday Times fall for this manipulation? And what does this say about our state of investigative journalism in this country? But in the same period, we saw also this story, what became known as Gupta Leaks, first broken by the Sunday Times in this extraordinary front page, he has proof, Mr. President, and then picked up by Aman Bungani, the independent investigative unit, um, who ran a series of stories then, um, which got to the heart of, uh, of, of the issues of state capture. Um, uh, Gupta Leaks was one of the great triumphs of investigative journalism, both in this country and around the world, playing an extraordinary key role in exposing and help uh, put the brakes on state capture in this country. Um, what made it great journalism? What made it great journalism was not that they'd got a leak of uh, a big cache of emails from within the Gupta Empire, but that they were able from this massive uh, few hundred thousand uh, emails, a massive data to extract and link and join the dots and find the stories hidden within. The fact that it appeared in Sunday Times first um, was something of a mystery because Amam Mugani had had the material for a few months. Um, so these two stories that I'm describing, uh, the Sunday Times and its series of apologies and Gupta leaks, are the two stories at the heart of my book, at the, the highs and the lows of South African journalism in this period. As you can see, we hit fantastic heights with the Gupta Leaks stories uh, of huge local and international impact. And we hit incredible lows um, with the Sunday Times stories. Um, and so that's really why I set out to do this book. Um, 
I thought that if I looked at these stories and took a deep dive into what lay behind them, um, I would be able to explain a great deal. Oh, oops, I'm sorry, something's happened to my screen here. Let me go back. There we are. Um, um, sorry. Um, if I looked at the highs and lows of South African journalism through these stories, um, I would be able to um, give a much greater understanding to readers about what, how journalism works, how the news media works. Um, it's my view that um, as we face huge issues of disinformation, as we face huge issues in the news media and its credibility and its authority and its capacity to deal with the onslaught, the pandemic of disinformation that's swamping us, what is needed is a much greater public understanding of how journalism works. So one of my main aims in writing this book was to try to give a deeper understanding by showing what happens behind big stories of this sort, both great stories, the highs, and problematic stories, the lows. Um, and I felt that would enable one to know what journalism can do and what it cannot do. Um, and a deeper understanding of it generally. But I also wanted to open my my friends and colleagues and fellow journalists to much greater public scrutiny. Um, you know, there used to be a tacit understanding, what was called in the language of the time, a gentleman's understanding. Not that there were many gentlemen among journalists, but an understanding that um, one didn't attack journalists, one didn't criticize one's fellow journalists. If they made mistakes, we ignored them, we allowed others to correct or point it out or take it up. But I think that's an old fashioned attitude. And I think we have seen a need in recent years for a much greater accountability, for a much greater transparency um, among journalists. Um, we, in, if we are to be accountable, we need to be accountable to each other first. Um, and I think I'm hopefully taking part in a new process of bringing greater accountability into journalism. And I think that depends on much greater transparency. And I think we are seeing um, across the board in journalism, a new culture of transparency emerging where journalists should and often do feel much more obliged to explain what they do, what they didn't do, where they got the information, how they processed it, what they know, what they don't know, what they can't know, um, and display their limitations, um, as well as give an understanding of what they can do and how they do it. And I think that's very important, and I hope my book contributes to a greater culture of openness and accountability um, in my profession, among my colleagues, um, journalists. So my book is divided into a look at what I call fast journalism and what I call slow journalism. A fast journalism for me captures many of the problems that ensued that, that, that I show happened at the Sunday Times. Um, I took apart what happened at the Sunday Times at three levels, which I felt I had to do. First, I looked at the individuals involved the journalists who um, were responsible for the story. And it wasn't just any journalists, because it was the Sunday Times investigative team. It had an extraordinary reputation. It, it had done many important and great and powerful investigative stories in the previous decade. And so the journalists involved, Stefan Hofstadter, Mazila Kaziwa Africa, Peter Ampedi, and sometimes Rob Rose, were really some of the country's best known um, and most admired investigative journalists. Um, so at one level, I had to look at what they did, ask the questions, did they mess up or was it something else? Was it that they were ideologically um, um, or otherwise engaged with state capture? Were they in fact themselves corrupted uh, in a way that um, and that got them 
to play the role they did in these stories. Because one really must emphasize that um, these stories did an extraordinary level of damage to institutions that were so important to our state, the revenue services and the hawks in particular. Um, it, these stories empowered those who wanted to capture and drive out from these organizations um, some of the people who were resisting state capture and who were exposing or investigating corruption. It messed up their lives and their careers and did incredible hurt and damage to them. But it also left these institutions hollowed out. And the role of the, of the, of the newspaper was to run a story, a narrative, um, that enabled those who wanted to get rid of individuals in these organizations and weaken these organizations. It gave them the, the, the tools to do so. So um, it really was of enormous consequence to our country, um, our politics, our democracy, our economy, um, um, and our capacity to deal with the issues that we're having to deal with in this country. So the first level was to look at the individuals involved and ask the questions about whether they just got it wrong um, and whether they were corrupted. And you'll see in my book that I give an, a varied view. Um, I suspect that there was some corruption of individuals. Um, I couldn't have put my finger on exactly what it was and who it was, but I think there are strong indications um, that there was corruption. Um, but much more, I think, um, it was it was uh, what happened on the second level, which is when I look at the culture and practices of the Sunday Times, um, that certain ways had emerged in which they did their investigations that led to the problems we are seeing. Um, and that's where I take what I think is an important look at practices and journalistic culture um, that had developed in the Sunday Times over many years. What I describe is a situation where the Sunday Times had been our biggest paper, by far our most powerful newspaper, um, and uh, were able to get away with a lot because they were the agenda setters. In the era of traditional media, um, when it was much harder to correct or confront or take on newspapers who got things wrong. Um, but times had changed and social media and the internet had given the public and other journalists a much greater capacity to challenge the newspaper. They were no longer, when these stories came along, the agenda setters, the gatekeepers they had been in uh, an earlier stage when newspapers like themselves were much more powerful. Um, times had changed, but they hadn't quite realized that they were now much more accountable and could be held to account through social media if they did get things wrong. And uh, part of what happened to the newspaper was a catching up um, as they were held to account uh, by other publications and by people who used social media to embarrass them and point out um, where things were going wrong. Um, but what had happened in the period of their power and arrogance was that um, they had begun to cut corners. And this had got worse as they came under financial pressure um, in the 21st century. I think we all know that traditional media and newspapers in particular came under enormous financial pressure as their business model, their advertising based business model um, began to fall apart and they began to lose advertising and revenue and readers because of the impact of the internet. And um, this put them under growing financial pressure. Um, this meant that the newsroom and the editors were coming under growing pressure from management um, to sell more newspapers, uh, to stop losing readers, um, to firm up the paper's brand and its standing. And it was expressed in the desire for powerful big splash front pages. Um, everyone I spoke to in the newsroom of the Sunday Times described 
the extraordinary pressure they came under every week to produce um, big splashes on the front page that would help sell the newspaper. Now, when the paper was at its peak in the 1980s and perhaps into the early 1990s, and they had a very large staff and they had huge resources, they were massively profitable, and they had a large newsroom, um, they had enough people and enough senior journalists um, to produce a big story almost every week. But what happened as financial pressures came in the 21st century was that they had to cut corners, they had to cut costs, um, they had fewer journalists, they had fewer specialists, they had fewer seniors and more junior journalists, um, and their capacity to produce the big story week after week was severely diminished. So the pressure was going up to produce the big splash and the capacity to produce it, to produce it was diminished. Um, and this put huge pressure, particularly on the investigative team, because it was the one place where they still had resources and seniors and the capacity to produce strong stories. But the pressure meant that they were pushed into rushing stories to, to practice a fast, a too fast journalism, um, or to take stories that were that were really destined for page four or five or six or seven and dolly them up, sex them up for the front page. And under those kinds of pressures, a number of practices started to emerge at the Sunday Times that um, compromised their journalism um, and led to the kinds of issues we're talking about and which I show and analyze and look very closely at in my book. I want to emphasize two of them. Um, that were deeply embedded in the Sunday Times culture and practice, um, and which I think are important lessons um, for journalists and journalism anywhere in the world. The one was they developed the practice of phoning the subjects of their stories as late as possible to put the allegations to them. What had happened is that particularly in the, in the earlier period, they had found that if they if they gave time to the subjects of their stories who, who were in government or in or had resources and capacity to challenge them, um, those people then rushed to court to try and stop the story or, or try to exert influence in other ways to try and stop the story um, or leaked the story to try and preempt what they did in other media and to try and uh, put a different spin on it before the Sunday Times got to it. And what the Sunday Times started to do as a regular practice is say, we'll put the story to the subject as late as possible. This meant they did it on a Friday afternoon or on a Saturday morning and sometimes even a Saturday afternoon uh, when they went to um, press, when their first edition went to press, um, early Saturday uh, evening or late Saturday afternoon. Uh, so they really gave often no more than an hour or two to their subjects to respond. This is significant for two reasons. The one is, you know, it's very hard to adequately respond to a complex and difficult allegation in that short period of time. But more seriously, it means, I think, that you're treating the right of reply you're treating giving the subjects of your story the right of reply just as a formal exercise of box ticking. And you're not allowing for the fact that maybe they will give you a substantial reply that will challenge and question and lead you to rethink your story because you're on deadline and you don't want to see your story fall apart. And uh, you're under pressure from your editor, he's under pressure from the manager, um, you're on deadline. And the last thing you want is the subject of your story to produce a narrative or evidence or an argument that undermines your story. Um, so fundamentally, it leads to bad journalism. Um, and I think that became very deep rooted at the newspaper, a really appalling and terrible practice um, 
and um, um, subjects of the story, the people in the heart of these stories will tell you that they still, one of them said to me, he still starts to get a queasy feeling um, on a Friday afternoon or when the phone rings on a Saturday, thinking, uh-oh, it's the Sunday Times again, and they're going to give me an hour or two to respond to something. And quite often that asked them to respond to something they hadn't seen before, such as a report that had been released, um, and ask them to respond, or even show them just a page or two of it, and expect them to respond more fully. So that's one of the many practices and corner cutting things that I think led to the problems that we are seeing, we, that we saw in the Sunday Times. The other one I wish to emphasize, wish to emphasize because, because it goes, it goes to part, part of uh, the journalistic, journalistic practice, practice, is, is that um, what the Sunday Times attitude was, uh, was very much they wanted a simple story. They wanted it 800 words long. They didn't want to confuse readers with contradictory facts. They wanted it clear. They wanted to be firm. And the editorial line was don't give ifs and buts and maybes to your audience. Don't give them different versions. If you believe something, make take it take a firm stand. Give that to your reader. Uh, doubt weakens the story, strengthen the story. And that developed over time into what they internally knew as the Sunday Times treatment. Uh, keep the story short, keep it tight, uh, put people at the center of it, um, and keep it clear. And one of the things they did was they, take, they took out any of the, the normal qualifications that we use as journalists. Um, to show that we might be unsure of elements of a story, to say something is alleged, or to put it in quotation marks, or to say this is what some sources say, um, or to um, raise anything that um, qualifies um, facts. Um, the Sunday Times treatment was to put it through a series of editors who saw their role, not as testing the story, not as verifying the story, not as checking the story, but as cleaning it up uh, and tidying it up, making it as sharp as possible. And in that process, um, allegations quickly became assertions and those um, quickly uh, read as facts. Um, they gave one narrative. Don't give competing narratives, give one narrative. Um, it's easier to read, it's easier to understand, and it makes the story stronger. This is deeply problematic because we all know that uh, life is complicated, stories are complicated, politics is complicated. There's never one narrative. There's always competing narratives. Um, and the job of a journalist is to get the reader to understand how and why and what the competing narratives are. I'm not suggesting that it has to be um, uh, different narratives uh, get the same weight or that one's job as a journalist is just to put the narratives out there for the reader to decide. The journalist's job is to show um, which narratives are stronger and which are weaker and which are credible and which are verified and which have evidence um, and which come from good sources and bad sources and make all those decisions and judgments, um, but to accept and show that there is never one narrative. Um, and good journalism is about is about showing the reader the complexities, the nuances, the competing narratives of a story. Um, I want to say, just as a side issue, that two common phrases that we hear in discussing the, the media and journalism are phrases I never use in my book, and I think it's valuable to explain why. The one phrase is objectivity. We know that there's ongoing and um, um, and uh, almost endless um, discussions about whether journalism can and should uh, 
be objective. I find the phrase not useful in the debate and discussion, um, so I don't use it at all. I think we look for balance. I think we look for fairness. I think we accept uh, that we have biases, we have prejudices, and it's our job to address those and try uh, not make them um, override our good judgment in a story. But I think it's our job to accept that we must and do make judgments, uh, um, that we have to try and qualify how we make those judgments as best we can. Um, but, it, but our job is to understand our biases, our limitations, um, uh, rather than get involved in um, any illusions about objectivity. The other phrase I never use, you will see if you look at my book, is fake news. We know it's a common, much abused, much thrown around uh, contemporary phrase. But I don't think it's useful because it's so often abused by the likes of Donald Trump and others who apply it just to news they don't like or news they disagree with or news they want to discredit. So I think it's become a not very useful term. Um, I talk about misinformation and I talk about disinformation. And I, and I mean disinformation by deliberate misinformation that's designed to disrupt and uh, discredit genuine information and um, and disrupt our political debate and discussion um, and undermine our political debate and discussion and discourse. So interestingly, those are phrases I avoid and I think are best avoided because they don't particularly help um, our knowledge and our understanding of um, what happens. I talked about the first couple of levels of what I examine in my book, at the personal level of the journalists involved, the Sunday Times culture, which I've described quite a lot of now. But, you know, it becomes apparent as you look at it that it all happens in the wider context of problems within our media as a whole. So it's necessary also to look at why our media is in such financial and um, other difficulty um, why journalism is under such press and such st such stress. Um, um, and um, I think broadly speaking, many of us know that it's the decline of advertising that's and and because of the rise of the internet that's affecting journalists, and that we're in the middle of a transition to find new ways in which to fund and support and enable good journalism in a situation where the old financial models uh, no longer do the job. And that leads me um, to why the Gupta Leaks uh, model, what I call slow journalism, how that manages to continue to thrive in our country when the media as a whole, particularly the traditional media, is under such threat. Um, it is because the new phenomenon we are seeing is the emergence of standalone, independent, specialist, um, non-profit, um, often philanthropically funded units like Amambogani um, and others which have sprung up in this and are springing up around the world and the continent to start to fill some of the gaps in our journalism. And it's because of the rise of these that we can say, despite our media as a whole being in such trouble, we have these pockets of excellence which tend to now, the most interesting journalism is coming from these standalone independent units, uh, supported not by selling advertising by and large, as uh, some of them supported through membership models, uh, through through uh, public funding um, and through foundations and generous and wealthy individuals who back and support and enable them to happen. Clearly that raises issues of whether it's sustainable um, when that philanthropy moves on to other causes. But for now, it's interesting that the best resourced, most financially stable institutions are these non-profit specialist units 
Um, and to name a few in this country, there's Amambogani, there's Becker Caesar, which does health. There's the Oxpeckers Investigative Unit, which does um, investigative stories. There's Ground Up, which does much more community-based local stories. Um, and we're seeing bodies like this in America, in, in institutions like ProPublica, um, which has done extraordinarily strong work as a non-profit specialist unit. And we're seeing it across Africa. There's uh, such a unit now in Lesotho. There's one in Botswana called Inc. Um, um, and there's others springing up um, to fill this gap. I'm not sure if it's a long-term solution to the problems in our media. Um, it's not the only solution that's being proposed, but I think what my book illustrates is the deep, deep difficulties as the major mainstream media grapples with um, its financial model and its loss of readers. Um, these new institutions are moving in uh, and let me emphasize that they're moving in on the back of using the internet, um, both as their source of stories, um, their way of investigating stories, and their way of reaching their audience. Um, so these are very important developments that I think are illustrated in my book. Um, and what's great, you know, they have the luxury of good funding. Um, so it means they're able to practice a slower, more thoughtful, more careful journalism on ver of verification, of taking their time to make sure they get it right. Now, that's a great luxury. And people in the mainstream media and traditional newsrooms will say, well, aren't they lucky? They've got that extraordinary privilege. Uh, but I guess I'm saying to all of our journalists that we have to take a deep breath. We have to slow down. We have to place much more emphasis on uh, verification, on ethical practice, on not cutting corners, on getting the story complete and right or as complete as possible and as right as possible. And when we make errors to fixing them as quickly as we can. <coughs> I think that um, as I move to wrap up and perhaps take questions and comments, um, a lot of what I try to demonstrate in my book, and I hope if you read it, you will get a much greater detailed understanding of how journalists operate, uh, because I think it's really important that we have much greater understanding of the of the workings of media. And much of what I try and show um, was borne out in developments just this week. For one thing, you will know that the Zondo Commission um, has heard evidence of our state security agency having um, been actively trying to disrupt and undermine and corrupt the media. It's alleged they had journalists on their payroll, they had some outlets on their payroll, and that they were, they were deeply involved in trying to, um, on behalf of President Zuma and the State Capture Project, to try and undermine their media critics and to convey what we could call the Zuma narrative, the state capture narrative in our media. Now, in my book, you'll see um, that I gave uh, the first indications of this by speaking to state security agent people and agents and um, contractors who spoke about how they spent their time and their efforts and their resources trying to promote certain stories and undermine other stories in the media. Um, and this has been uh, confirmed and carried further by the important re revelations in the Zondo Commission this week. But you might also um, have seen the release last week of the Satchel Commission of Inquiry, the Satchel Panels Inquiry, um, commissioned by the South African National Editors Forum to look into the problems in the media and the lapses in journalistic practice and ethics. It's a very important piece of work, a 400-page um, detailed look at the problems, um, both at the Sunday Times and our media in general. And, you know, one has to say that I look at the Sunday Times, and the Sunday Times is a high-profile case, but it's not the worst case. Um, um, we have other media institutions that played a 
much more direct um, role in spreading the state capture story and we're very much part of the state capture project. I think of the SABC, which in that period was very much in the hands of the state capture people. Um, and I think in particular of independent newspapers. Uh, and I think of the Gupta's own um, uh, newspapers and television channel, which were deliberately very much part of the state capture project. The reason I and others are concerned with the Sunday Times is because it's a more interesting and more important case because the Sunday Times claimed to be independent, vigorous, good at investigative journalism. So the question is, why did they become corrupted um, by what happened in state capture? Because the picture that emerges all, overall is how that corruption crept into the media, but it crept into the Sunday Times more than most, and, and, and we're all asking why and trying to answer why it was the Sunday Times when they tried to sell the same stories to other papers such as City Press who were uh, who less vulnerable. And I think my description of the Sunday Times practice and culture and pressures and, and arrogance um, from being the most powerful agenda-setting newspaper um, tells you why they were most vulnerable to these attempts to corrupt them. And let me emphasize, it's really important that we get to the bottom of the role of the state security agency in corrupting the media in, 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 in that period. We know it happened under apartheid. We are shocked to discover it still happened um, in democracy. And it really points to the need to get a tight hold on our state security agency and others involved in intelligence, like police crime intelligence, um, because this can so easily corrupt other institutions like the media and the judiciary. So I think um, those recent reports have reinforced what I try and show in my book. Um, let me say that um, um, I tackle the tough situation our media is in um, precisely because, um, and let me get rid of my screen because it's no longer really um, relevant, precisely because um, um, we really have to get greater openness, greater accountability and greater responsibility in our media. Um, I think I, I have great faith that we will do so, um, but um, um, I think there is a lot to be done. And the first thing we have to do is try and introduce and encourage a new culture of um, transparency in journalism and in the practice of journalism and a greater accountability to the public and the readers we serve. I think let me leave it there um, and see if there's any questions or comments people want to respond to or any discussion we can have coming out of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm just going to take some, see if there are any questions and comments. Hello? Yes? Can you hear me? Did, yes, if you can just put your hand up, let me know who you are. If you just, uh, do you know the icon, raise your hand. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. What is your name? Just my, name is, <clears throat> my name is Alec Anderson. Hi, Alec. Uh, I have so, four questions, Anton. First of all, you haven't mentioned anything about the Maverick. You might have mentioned it in your book, but I don't know where the Maverick fits into your analysis of the present quality of our journalism. Secondly, to what extent are shareholders in these journalism, in these journal publications and their initiatives, to what extent are they important in the integrity of the news? Thirdly, to what extent are these things ideologically driven? And do we have to necessarily look for an ideology in the stuff that we read? And finally, I've always thought that the editor's forum was some form of collective disciplinary influence on in the quality of the journalism. Have these guys got lost their testicular fortitude? 
<laughs> well, that's a whole series of questions. Let me try and answer the key points and uh, and 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 we can take it from there. Um, you're right, I actually erred in not saying more about the Daily Maverick. Um, the Daily Maverick was the first institution to receive the, um, the Gupta Leaks material, and then they got together with Amman Bungani and later News24 uh, because they didn't have the investigative resources at that stage um, to deal with that massive information and documentation on their own. And Amman Bungani had been working in that area for at least a decade, so they were well equipped to do so. Um, but Daily Maverick played a very important role in uh, Gupta Leaks. Um, and and um, I should have been saying Amman Bungani and Daily Maverick together in that. Daily Maverick now has, I think, become a very important voice. Um, it, it, it has grown a great deal and got quite a lot of uh, support um, as a result of its role in Gupta Leaks and in challenging state capture, building their credibility and their capacity. Um, and I think is an important voice in South African journalism. And, and when you talk about standalone units, independent units, I, I put them among it, although they're not non-profit, they're different in that way. Um, they're, they're funded in a variety of ways and they're pushing the new model of, of membership um, as a way of um, securing their financial future. So I think it's an important voice, Daily Maverick. A lot of it is more opinion than reporting, but they're doing more and more reporting all the time. Um, but I think it's become an important element um, in our South African landscape. Um, you know your question about um, SANEF. Look, SANEF is a, a is a is a body of editors. It is not a disciplinary body. Um, it tries to bring all editors together. Um, and the disciplinary body, the self-regulatory disciplinary body, is the press council and the press ombudsman. And in the case of broadcasting, the Broadcast Complaints Commission. Um, we've built up strong self-regulatory um, mechanisms to try and deal with our media over the years. Um, and if you look at the Satchel report, she says, actually, they're working quite well. And interestingly, in the Sunday Times case, they played an important role in challenging those stories, in forcing the Sunday Times to eventually back down um, and admit they got it wrong and correct their, their their intervention there was very important in a series of findings they made in late 2017 that led to the Sunday Times um, pulling back. It took longer than it should, but it wasn't the press council's fault. It was because of the difficulty some of the characters had um, in bringing the matter to the press council. Um, um, but let me emphasize that Satchwa has recommended that the press council get more, what did you call it, testicular strength? Testicular uh, fortitude. Yes, fortitude. Um, she's recommended that they, um, that they give themselves the power to give greater sanctions and fines to journalists. Um, and they tighten things up. And I think we all see a need for strong, tight self-regulation because we certainly don't want regulation to come from politicians and the state which would undermine our freedom of expression. I want to emphasize one last point in relation to the press council and this process. The big problem with the self-regulatory system are the rogue institutions such as, let me say it straight, independent newspapers um, who do not subject themselves to the authority and discipline um, of the professional body of the press council. And that's um, of great concern to all journalists because it undermines and damages everything we do. And that's something we have to confront. I hope I've answered most of your questions. Um, you, you didn't deal with the matter of ideology. To what extent does one look for ideology in what one reads? Look, look, I think we're all aware that one effect of the internet and social media is to keep us in silos, that it's possible to read only the opinions and the views of those one agrees with. Um, it's not like media of old, which drew together a range of views and opinions. 
Um, it's much easier in social media in particular to stay within your own silo um, and to never be reading uh, opinions you don't agree with. So one has to be very conscious of that um, and of not allowing that. Um, um, the basic rule that you have to consume as much as possible, as many different things as possible. So, so I think transparency means making it clear where you stand on issues, what your values um, um, are in as a journalist and as a media outlet. And I think as a reader, our responsibility is to make sure we're aware of, um, of what those values are, whether we agree or disagree with them, and make sure we're getting as diverse a range of views as perspectives and sense of values and ideologies as possible in order to make up our minds, uh, to break down those silos. I think that's an important responsibility as a consumer and reader of news. Agree. Thank you. Thank you, Anton and Alex. Liz McDay. Liz, you have your hand up? Yep. Um, hi, Anton. Thanks for a good chat. I, um, I just wondered what your view was on journalism as a profession and the journalists themselves who were impacted by this, this uh, state capture project, you called it. Um, because I know many journalists who left the profession or were forced out, particularly on the independent newspaper side, and some of them are now kind of freelancing or which puts them at risk of being sold to the highest bidder. Um, and then also means that maybe the best journalists as journalists and so just some how does how has this impacted on journalism as a profession and you know some of those implications um, let me say first of all that I deal in my book with um, the 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 practice we've had in journalism uh, to bring to allow disgraced journalists to come back um, and we cite a few cases of journalists who behaved uh, despicably, were disciplined and fired, but allowed back a few years later into journalism, even though they hadn't always repented. I think we know that if you repent and you correct your practices, one should be open to, um, to, to, to forgiveness uh, and to re-entry. But, you know, the case of Mazilakaziwa Africa who's central to what happened at the Sunday Times is interesting because he'd been fired some five years before for unethical behavior, for not declaring conflicts of interest, doing, doing business deals on the side of his journalism. But they were de he was a very good investigative journalist, so they let him back in um, and he led them down um, the wrong path again. <clears throat> so clearly, as, a, as, a, as journalists and as media owners and we need to tighten up um, on on under what conditions we allow disgraced people to return into journalism. Um, and let me say that in the Sunday Times case, um, most of the journalists um, were were dismissed, not all of them, but most of them were dismissed or left of their own accord. Um, um, and um, but what I do raise in my book is the fact that many of them got some of them got financial settlements and had their hands tied um, in terms of non-disclosure agreements that stopped them speaking out. And I think both of those unfortunately rewarded them and protected the newspapers in ways that really shouldn't shouldn't happen. Um, the issue of professionalism is a complicated one because, yes, part of what we're trying to do is professionalize what we do and establish professional rules and practices and codes um, and the capacity to act against those who undermine or break those codes uh, or behave unethically. But we can't do it in the way other professions do it. We can't do it as lawyers and doctors and accountants do that make it illegal to practice um, unless you have the qualifications because we believe in free speech and we believe we can't give um, anyone the power to say only certain people can be journalists, only certain people can express themselves in the media and others can't. 
So it's an anomaly in journalism that we can't police the profession in the same way. But we can self-regulate um, and we can isolate and drive out of the profession those we think do not accept our ethics and our rules and our conduct. And hopefully we will see more of that happening um, as we tighten up the self-regulatory system. Thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up, Recha? Please yeah, do. Go through. Go through. Um, how transparent is the press council? It's pretty transparent. I mean, I sat last week in on one of their hearings. Um, so let me say that um, there's an ombudsman process which, which, um, um, uh, which tries to either resolve the issue or make a ruling. And then if, they, if, if, if necessary, they then call a hearing. Um, those hearings are open. Um, they are recorded. All judgments and, and, um, and, and information that informs it are available on their website. Um, um, so it's a pretty open process. It has to be, um, and, and, and it is pretty open. I think there, I think there are ways we can um, strengthen it. Um, and those are under discussion. Um, uh, but as long as people join and abide by it, it, it provides a quick and relatively cost-free and easy way for members of the public to confront media problems and media mistakes and media uh, problems without the cost and the time of having to go through a court process. Thanks very much. Thank you, Liz, for that uh, question. Um, there is another hand. Will I see another hand? Are there any other questions? If you have a question, just use the raise the hand icon and we can see that you've raised your hand. I'll just check the chat to see where it comes. I don't see any, any other hands. Anybody else? Well, we've got about, it's almost two o'clock, so I think we've, Anton, unless you have some final comments you want to make. But I Not at all. My book, So For The Record, it's published by Jonathan Ball. Um, and it's available both online and through um, good bookshops and some not so good bookshops. Uh, and obviously, I would encourage you to take a look. Okay, I see there's someone. Um, someone said something in the chat. Let me just see who is Ellen. Oh, it's just a thank you. Oh, she's just thanking. Okay, there are no more comments or questions. And yes, thank you, Anton. We certainly look. Very, I certainly look forward to reading your book. And and yeah, oh Liz, thank you very much for fascinating insight into the press world. We've said, yeah, I've certainly learned a lot from this talk. And thank you everybody for participating. Um, yeah, because a, a lecture or a talk is always a product of the listeners or the audience and the speaker. Thank you very, very much. On behalf of the summer team, Anton, I would really like to thank you. Thank you.